surges are over voltages. So a voltage beyond the rating that an electrical installation was designed to operate at. Lightning is probably the one source of an overvoltage that we're all familiar with. But there are man-made causes of overvoltages as well. For example, those caused by the switching of large electric motors. It can be a lot more than the switching of large electric motors. It can be welders, AC units, lifts. A lot of in the first test, we're going to see an older style consumer unit, typical of many properties in the UK. And here we can see the retrofitted surge protective device. Right, let's hand over to Torben and Michael and see what happens. Here we've got an experiment to demonstrate induced over voltages. So let's have a look and see what we've got. This is going to be our installation with all our electronics. This is a surge protection device. This wire here is going to represent the lightning protection system running down the outside of the building. And this wire here is going to represent any electrical installation within the building. Now of course we've got a brick wall in between. But what's going to happen, the magnetic field in, in that conductor will induce a voltage into that conductor, even through the brickwork. So let's see what happens when I do the demonstration. Now, you can actually see that nothing happened. If you look at the electronics, they're still working away like a good one. That's because we've got a surge protection device in. Now let's pull out the surge protection device and repeat the experiment. As you can see, the lights have stopped flashing. So we've seen that overvoltages can be pretty destructive. And that although they can be caused by a direct lightning strike or by the switching of large electrical equipment, there's as much chance of your property importing surges through pipework and cables from a neighboring property. So what can be done to protect against these types of events? Well, I suppose you could pray or you could cross your fingers or make some do-it-yourself protection. If we can see a frozen AC supply waveform, where, depending on the country, each complete sine wave represents 1 50th or 60th of a second, the transient would look like this. Just a tiny peak on a single sine wave. So an SPD is designed to handle just this brief spike. It's not designed to handle longer duration over-voltage swells or under-voltage sags or radio frequency interference. The 10350 refers to manufacturer device testing using a simulated lightning strike waveform up to 100 kA. The 10 is the rise time in microseconds that it takes the strike to reach 50% of its peak current. The 350 is the time in microseconds that it takes the strike to fall back to half its peak current. The shaded area, therefore, gives a visual indication of the total amount of current for the duration of the strike. Looking at this particular arrangement, we can see that the SPD unit is connected in parallel with the main switch, and that the conductors for line, neutral and earth have been kept as short as possible, remembering that the SPDs act like a potential divider. These short runs ensure that the resistance of the SPD part of the installation is as low as possible, so that more surge current passes through the SPD to earth rather than flow into the rest of the electrical installation. We can see that the earthing connection between the SPD and the main earthing terminal is kept away from all of the other conductors. You will also notice that the cross-section area of the line and neutral conductors are much smaller than the meter tails. We will examine the size and length consideration for conductors when we examine the requirements of the 17th edition amendment number one. Another thing to point out is that this setup is only using the display on the front of the SPDs to provide an indication the, the main variable that can affect this coordination is the length of cable between devices. It will be necessary to refer to the manufacturer for accurate data. But as a rule of thumb, cable runs less than 10 metres will not be acceptable. This is because the longer the cable, the higher the volt drop, 
which will essentially alter the operational specification of the upstream device, making it closer in spec to the downstream device, so improving coordination. However, due to advances in technology, some manufacturers provide devices that have eliminated this problem. Regulation 534.2.2 is concerned with how SPDs are connected between specific conductors, referring the reader initially to Table 53.2 which details the various ways that these devices can be fitted for different types of supply system. The reason for the differences depends on how the installation earth is provided for each type of supply system. It can be quite a complex topic, so if you are specifying SPDs, it's well worth checking the methods detailed in the Amendment 1 on-site guide. <laughs> Finally, a quick look at how SPDs affect the electrical testing of the installation. Tony, with surge protective devices being wired in parallel with the installation, are there any then issues with earth fault loop impedance or insulation resistance tests or any other tests for that matter? Well, it depends upon the technology that is used within the surge protective device. Some of these can give false readings when undertaking insulation resistance tests and possible earth fault loop impedance tests. Again, I will check the manufacturer's guidance and, if in doubt, isolate the surge protection devices. Of course, if you do switch off the surge protection, don't forget to switch it back on when you finish.